go, folks. The chair notes it's 6.01 p.m. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Tammy Parks. Here. Mr. Dylan Maxfield. Here. Mr. Craig Meadows. Mr. Gil John Gilbert. I can see him. Uh, here, <laughs> present. <laughs> there. Just taking roll call, Steve. Yeah. Yep, you got it. Great. Um, so with that, I we do have a quorum present. Uh, I want to note the presence of our associate member, Ms. Sarah Marshall, who will serve on the first panel today tonight. I also want to welcome our newly appointed members, Mr. Vince Connor O'Connor, um, and Mr. Slavater and Mr. Heltzer are, cannot be at this uh, meeting tonight. We'll have a more fulsome introduction later in the meeting. Also attending the meeting tonight is um, Ms. Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, and Mr. Stephen McCarthy, Planner of the Town. We may be joined by Mr. Rob Mora, Building Commissioner, at a later point in the meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 21 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings at, in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the town of Amherst's YouTube page and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If the member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by, raising the, by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of a hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-07, Mohammed Malik Nais, to request an appeal under Section 11.42 of the Building Commissioners, under 11.242, of the building commissioner's decision of a notice of violation under sections 11.45 and 12.172 of zoning bylaw located at 25 nutting avenue map 11c parcel 104 general residence rg zoning district this is continued from both uh, our november 10th and our january 26th meetings we understand there's a request for withdrawal we will then have a chance to um, introduce our new ZBA members. 
we will have a we'll ha have a public meeting, a uh, discussion of the legal ad fee, and a presentation and discussion on the zoning from the department staff on two sets of zoning amendments, one proposed and one adopted. Following that, there will be general public comment on matters not before the board tonight, as well as other business not anticipated within 48 hours. And we hope to adjourn before nine o'clock. The first order of business tonight is ZBA FY 2023-07, Mohammed Melkanais. I hope I'm, I'm going to ask to, to pronounce that correctly when he comes on, to request an appeal under section 11.42 of the building commissioner's decision of notice of violation under section 11.45 and 12.172 of zoning bylaw, located at 25 Nutting Avenue, map 11C, partial 104, general residence RG zoning district. This is continued from 1110 and 126. Ms. Marshall was impaneled on November 10th for consideration of this matter. She will replace Mr. Gilbert for, this, for the purposes of this consideration. We have received the following submissions. A January 23rd, 2023 email conversation between Mr. Robert Seiko, attorney for the applicant, and Ms. Brestrup seeking to withdraw the appeal. I think that is the only submission we have received on this matter. Is that right, Chris or Ms. Brestrup? I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, you received documents in your packet for January 26th, and those documents included. Um, You're correct. Yep. I can tell you what those were. Do you have them, Mr. Judge? Yes, just a second. I put them aside just so I could do this, and I misplaced them, of course. Do you have them before you? I had them and then I, yes, I hear they are. I'm sorry. Yep. So I can read them. You had a um, special permit application that was signed by Mr. Malekniaz um, as the applicant and the property owner. And the application was to um, appeal a decision of the building commissioner. Yep. Um, you had a, a management plan that went along with that, which didn't really have any information on it. All the things were um, considered to be not applicable. You had a letter from um, the attorney, Mr. Sacco, dated October 13th. Um, and that included an application to the Zoning Board of Appeals and supporting exhibits, the application being for the appeal. Um, you had a letter dated September 29th. I'm sorry, I'm going back in time. Um, That's okay. And that letter was from the town uh, to the town clerk. Um, and that was a letter uh, requesting that um, the notice of violation be appealed. And that was signed by Mr. Sacco. Um, you had a letter dated August 30th from John Thompson, who's one of our building inspectors, and that was to Mr. Milikniaz, and that was a, a letter um, stating what the complaint was, and um, the complaint was that he had more than four individuals living at his property at 25 Nutting Avenue, and um, it was um, <clears throat> a notice of violation, and the fine for the violation was supposed to be $100 for each offense, and each day was considered a separate offense. Um, and I think he was given until September 14th to um, to meet the requirements of having less than, well, to have four or fewer people living in the house. Um, then I think mm. some of this is repetitive. Yep. Um, there was a residential lease and rental agreement. Um, and the date yep. of that was... The date of that was the 30th of February, 2022, signed by four people who were purportedly the um, tenants and signed by yep. the management. Um, <clears throat> there was a request for a, an emergency order under pains and penalties of perjury. Um, and it was an action against Mr. Malekniaz and it had to do with having more than four people in his uh, unit, in the unit. Um, 
There was a letter of September 26th. I'm not sure if I mentioned that one already. I don't think I did. And it was from Mr. Sacco to Declan Quinn, who I think might have been um, the person who was the additional occupant um, notified to vacate and deliver at the end of the month um, the end of the tenancy. Mm -hmm. um, and a letter to Mr. Mc Christopher McLean, uh, also a notice to vacate, and a letter to Mr. Robert Early, which was also a letter. Uh, a notice to vacate the apartment. Um, so um, since Mr. Uh, Malikniaz, who owns the property, um, wanted to be able to uh, take care of all this business in a kind of a, a not tumultuous manner, um, he, he wasn't able to meet the timeline that was set forth in the original complaint. And he did appeal the uh, decision of the building commissioner to um, to have the property be vacated of the tenants who were over four tenants. Um, and he was working on getting things straightened out. And so he, he asked for um, an extension of the time to hold the, the public hearing for the appeal. And that was extended to January 26th. Unfortunately, there was a problem with um, the public notice for the January 26th meeting, so that's why we're holding this meeting today. I did expect either Mr. Malekniaz or Mr. Uh, Sacco to be here tonight, but um, I think they might have gotten confused as a result of the January 26th meeting be being canceled because of lack of um, posting. So if the Zoning Board of Appeals would be um, inclined to do so, they could accept the withdrawal of this application for appeal based on my explanation and based on the paperwork that you had in your packet for January 26th and based on this email that Mr. Sacco sent asking to withdraw. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Brestrup. That um, gives us the details on the reason for the appeal and it does also um, identify their written request to withdraw the appeal. Um, we don't have, and, and you're right, we don't have anybody representing the applicant at this point on the, on the call. I don't see anybody in the participants or attendees, I mean, that are doing that. So um, we will just proceed without a specific comment. Um, are there any members of the board that have any questions regarding this matter? Ms. Marshall. I do because I, for, I did not look back at the most recent materials. I apologize. So I'm, I'm not clear. Well, they filed the appeal, so now they want to withdraw it. Um, but right. it was, they wanted the fines postponed because they said it was they could not legally get rid evict those tenants until anyway so could perhaps Ms. Brestrup summarize what has happened and and state whether the town has any objection to the withdrawal the town may I oh Rob Morris yes. here he can probably oh. explain this much yep. better than I can so Mr. if Mora. Mr. Judge will recognize him yep. Mr. Mora yeah, yes, thank you. Um, so this matter has been resolved uh, and um, there were there were actually no fines issued. There was a viol notice of violation that as they typically do, they indicate that fines may be issued if the, um, you know, the violation continues and, and the owner doesn't take the proper steps to bring it to resolution. What we found was that the owner, in fact, did take the proper steps. They uh, notified their tenants and went into housing court and took the steps necessary to uh, bring this to to uh, a, a place where it's in compliance uh, with, with these types of matters where when there's tenants living in houses, it, it does take time. So it took until December 30th, and that was an agreement that we participated in the drafting of between the tenants and the landlords that uh, the 
the tenants leave by December 30th and bring the property into compliance. And uh, because they did that and worked towards that solution, we did not uh, end up uh, imposing any fines to this owner. So and there's no longer, to, but, well, go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Finish yeah, up. So they're not in violation. And as far as the town is concerned, they, they did what they needed to do. Is that correct? They, they, are, they were not in violation as of December 30th. Right. And given the, the, you know, the, the limitations and what a property owner can do to, uh, to remove occupants from the property to get compliance, we were satisfied with the approach they took uh, that wouldn't have, you know, we didn't have any other better option eviction process or otherwise wouldn't have been able to been had been resolved that in, in that time frame. So we were satisfied with the December 30th, um, you know, agreement that was made between those two parties to bring the property into compliance. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of the panel? If not, this is a public hearing and members of the public can comment on this. Um, I'll open it up to public comment. Are there any members of the public who wish to comment? And if so, please raise your hand and indicate so on the screen. Um, when you are, rec if recognized, Please identify yourself and your address and speak, try to main, uh, can, have your, your comment be limited to about three minutes. I don't see any people that wish to speak. Do you, Chris or no. Steve? Looks like it's clear. All right. If there are no further comments from the board, we have no comments from the applicant except for his uh, written re request. Uh, the question before the board, and I would entertain a motion, is that we accept the uh, request for withdrawal of, of, of ZBA 2020, ZBA 2023-07. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Marshall seconds it. Any discussion on the motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. This is a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Uh, Mr. Meadows is on this panel, but he's not attending. That's four votes. Four votes are what's needed to approve this. The motion carries four votes for one uh, absent. All right, that's settled. Next order of business is introduction of our new members. Um, so we have Vince O'Connor on the call. Uh, good to welcome Vince. Um, David Slavater and Jordan Helser both cannot make the meeting tonight. Um, we hope they'll be, we'll have another chance to meet as a board uh, through Zoom uh, in the near future where we can welcome them. But um, I had just a couple of thoughts that I prepared for the new members, Mr. O'Connor. And so I'm gonna ask you to step through it just for a, a minute or two, if you would. Um, ZBA has a very busy, the ZBA has a very busy schedule this year and I look forward to working with you on the many applications we are we anticipate considering. I know we have all served on committees and boards before and your ability to work collaboratively on committees is part of the reason the town council selected you to serve on the ZBA. And I wanna mention a few things that I have found important for all full members, as well as associate members of the ZBA. First is we, we conduct ourselves with full recognition of the role placed upon the board by the town. We are a quasi judicial body that applies and interprets the bylaw. We do not create new bylaws. We operate within a framework that requires us to follow certain procedures and make numerous findings in making our decisions. But our findings and decisions also require us to use our judgment, discretion, and experience in applying the bylaw. We are not in a straitjacket, but we operate within a framework in which we have all been appointed to use our best judgment on how to apply the bylaw. 
Second, it is important that we conduct ourselves in a manner that furthers the legitimacy of our actions. We want the applicants, as well as the general public, to believe that we are acting in a fair, transparent, and impartial manner. We should remind ourselves that often when a person comes before us, whether as an applicant or as a public commentor, it is often the most consequential interaction they will have with the town. They may be speaking about their most important asset in their lives, whether it's their home, their business, or their neighborhood, and they have a right to be heard and their concerns fairly evaluated. Thirdly, it's important that the board conduct itself in a collegial manner. And I think that involves a couple, a few things. If you're on a panel for a manner, please try to attend the site visit and read the material prior to the meeting. We have to get, we will try to get the material to you several days ahead of time to give you time to review it. Please try to sign on to our Zoom meetings five to 10 minutes before the meeting starts. That way we know we have a quorum to start the meeting. Please maintain a respectful dialogue with your fellow members. This has rarely been a problem in the ZBA, but as chair, I will not abide disrespectful comments to other board members or to the public. As an associate member, you will benefit from observing the meetings that you're not, even though you're not appointed to a panel. It will help you get up to speed faster. Also, as associate members, your principal role is to fill in when a full member cannot serve on the panel. I'm confident that with work schedules, vacations, family commitments, and conflicts of interest, of full members that will provide associate members with a chance to serve on panels. I think Ms. Marshall can vouch for the, how often she's been asked to serve on a panel, having only served as an associate member for six months, I think. So with that, I want to welcome you to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thank you for your commitment to, the public, to this public service and give you a chance to ask any questions you may have of me or other members of the staff. Okay. Do you need to get in or anything? No, I can. Okay. Hi. So, that's okay, Mr. O'Connor. I just I just opened it up to you if you had any questions. Um, I don't. I've read the a lot of the material that I was provided with, and um, I don't. I. I as, as some of the members may know, I, I, I actually have appeared before the zoning board uh, three times on appeals of the building commissioner's rulings, twice successfully, uh, a number of years ago, though, a number of decades ago, actually. Um, so, and I've attended very many planning board meetings over the years. So I'm, um, I'm pretty familiar with how the board conducts itself and how the uh, and how important it is that we, uh, our interactions with the public are respectful and attentive. And um, so uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have, you know, uh, to be available to the board uh, in, in case you need me and, um, uh, you know, bring what I can to the process. Thank you. It sounds like you're ready, willing, and able to help us, and we appreciate that. Great. Well, welcome aboard. And if you do have questions, we have a great staff. Uh, we've—I know we're a little short-staffed right now, but you guys are filling in very, very well, in spite of um, a couple of vacancies. Um, and I'm sure that that'll be as that'll continue to be excellent. So uh, you have staff you can talk to and. Um, they can really be of help. So I also have a couple, of, I have some materials from earlier um, seminars that I can give to um, Chris and she can she can pass it or Steve and then they can pass it on to you as well, Mr. O'Connor. So um, any way we can help you out, we will. All right, um, any other questions regarding from the, the members regarding um, what I just said or um, any questions regarding the, the business of the board before we go on to our other three items on the agenda, legal ad fees and two zoning changes, one proposed and one adopted. Just wanted to say uh, welcome on board, Banks. Glad to have you. Great. Thanks, Mr. Maxfield. All right, um, next order of business is legal, is a discussion about legal ad fees. Um, 
I think if you were, if the board members will recall, it was last August or September that a proposal came before the ZBA to change our bylaws to increase the legal ad fee that we charge applicants for special permits. The reason being is that the, the, the fee that we were charging was, I, I don't remember if it was 75 or $150, but it didn't come close to covering the cost of the legal ad fee, which sometimes runs in excess of 800, 900 or $1,000. So uh, the town was losing, was, it was costing the town a lot of money. And what we did at that, it was recommended to us that we increase the legal ad fee to 300, which partially covers some of the cost but wouldn't be a burden to, wouldn't be an you know, undue burden on um, homeowners that have smaller projects uh, that they wish to, that require a, a, a special permit. In that discussion, we came up, I think, what I know we came up with a consensus among the board members that we should try to, number one, uh, differentiate between owner occupants, single family homes and owner occupant, owner occupied duplexes and try to minimize cost on them and that a, the fee for the legal ad fee would be greater for non-owner occupied properties or income producing properties. And that was the, we wanted to have a sort of a bifurcated fee structure. We also wanted to have a fee structure that was similar or at least harmonized with the planning board's fee structure. So that would, it wasn't confusing and there wasn't a preference to go one route over the other uh, because of the structure of the legal ad fees. Um, the board voted to do that and the board voted to empower me to you know, to instruct me to go to the, talk to the uh, planning board chairman, try to uh, achieve that. I did speak with the planning board chairman along with staff who were in that meeting. And as I recall, we came up and this was in October or September, we came up with a, um, a package that would increase the fees, a proposal that would increase the fees to $500 for uh, all applications except for owner-occupied single-family homes and owner-occupied duplexes, where that fee would be, I think it was, was it 150, Chris? Is that what we agreed to? Do you, do you recall? That's correct, but I didn't yeah. remember the 500. So I'm remembering this a little differently, so. That's, that's yeah, that's a, um, it was a while ago, so. Um, I thought it was, I thought we'd agreed to 500 and you thought it, we, we were keeping it at 300. Oh, I, I know what it was. You know, we talked about going to 500 and then if I recall correctly, um, you wanted to run past, the staff wanted to run past the, um, the other staff members and see if, if that was more than you wanted to charge. If the 300 or 500, which made the most sense. I think that's what we discussed. And that's the reason that we didn't act on it right away is that you guys wanted to take a look at the fee structure and that in the planning department and you were in the middle of budget process and how it would impact the budget. Um, and I guess that's what the, um, and then you, you guys had a chance to, to do that since we had that meeting with the planning board. Um, I wonder if, have you given further thought, has the planning department given further thought to uh, the, the fee that should be charged for all but single family homes and owner occupied single family homes and owner occupied duplexes. Um, may I speak? Yep, please. Yep. Yes, please. Um, we have given some thought to it and I've had a conversation with the um, chair of the planning board. Um, we did settle on a fee of $300 for all planning board um, applications and the planning board doesn't have very many single family or two family applications. It turns out that we have had two recently. We had one where there was someone who had a two family house and he wanted to build a single family house on the same property. Actually, that turned out to be a zoning board of appeals um, public hearing, but the planning board had considered that uh, project and made a recommendation to the zoning board. So that was one that they did consider. Of course, they didn't charge a fee for that because that was just a recommendation. And then recently we've had a two-family house on Spalding Street, which is a case where there is a single family or there was a single family house. It became a two-family house and the uh, owners of the house are um, renting the second unit, but they're also renting three other bedrooms. So 
my most recent conversation with the planning board chair is that the planning board doesn't really have the kind of small projects that the zoning board has. And when it does have a two family house, it tends to be something where someone is potentially making, you know, $1,000 a month per bedroom on the, on the extra unit. So he didn't sound like he was very, very uh, eager to lower the fees for um, single family or uh, excuse me, owner occupied homes. We don't get the kinds of applications that the ZBA does with regard to nonconformities and things like that. If it's just a nonconformity, um, those tend to, um, you know, the single family house with a nonconformity would go to the ZBA ordinarily, or it could be dealt with by the building commissioner. I think that's exactly the way it is currently dealt with. And maybe Rob Mark could speak to that a little bit more. But I think if we're going to change the planning board's current um, legal ad, I would have to go back to the planning board and talk to them about it. And I haven't done that yet. Um, I could put it on the agenda for their meeting next week. So I think there's more to be said about this. And um, I don't feel like we can necessarily reach a conclusion tonight, but it sounded the last time I talked to the planning board chair, it sounded like he was satisfied leaving the fee at a flat 300 for now. Okay. So um, there's two, there are two things here, it seems Ms. Ms. Bressrup. The first is there doesn't seem to be as much overlap as we thought when we first began this process between the kinds of applications that the Zoning Board of Appeals receives and the Planning Board receives. And therefore, the need to harmonize the fee structure between the two bodies may not be as great as we thought originally. Is that Would that be a fair assessment? I think that's a good assessment, yeah. Okay. And so then, despite our efforts to do that, it may be, it may be something that's not worth pursuing if we wish to um, change our fee structure. And so the next question becomes, We've adopted the $300. So if we if we no longer feel a need to harmonize with the planning board because there just isn't a lot of overlap, um, then the question becomes, do we leave the fee structure as it is of $300 per application as we have in our, uh, as per the recommendation of the staff and as we have in our bylaws, or do we wish to increase it and differentiate it some way or, or um, and I guess I would leave that up to the, to the, uh, the board to discuss. Um, and in our meeting back in September, I know that Mr. Maxfield and others on the board, um, and I think Mr. Um, also Mr. Meadows talked about wanting to cover more of the cost to the town for income producing property and less cost to individuals with a single family homes or single family or owner occupied homes and owner occupied duplexes. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm also of that opinion. The question is, um, and it's in our power to increase the fees. The question is, do we want to do that as a board, increase the fees charged by the ZBA at this time, or do we want to study it? And I would open that up to members of the, of the board to consider this. And on this matter, it's the, the full members of the board that will vote on this, all members, associate members as well, will can discuss on it. But full members of the board are the ones that are allowed to modify our bylaws. And that's what this would be, is a modification of the bylaw. But everybody, all members of the board can speak to it. Um, I, Ms. Marshall, you were up first. Yeah, um, I think, in general, that it's helpful to have things in writing because I don't remember what the kind of what what the range of options might be. Um, but but also, and maybe I misunderstood this when it first came up. I thought the town's goal was to have the applicants cover the full charge of the ads, and as you said, it can be as much as a thousand dollars. So three hundred wouldn't come close to. Um, covering that so did i misunderstand is the town still hoping that we will raise these fees substantially so but in any case i think it would be use, useful to have have it all written down <laughs> yep um either miss breastrup or mr mora what is the, the 
you last time suggested 300 uh, as an increase from 75 or 150. Um, and does Ms. Marshall remember correctly that you wanted to cover it all? And if not, um, why, what was the reason for picking the 300, I guess? May I? Yes, Ms. Bresta, please. Yep. So we felt that the 300 was kind of halfway there to go all the way from 75 up to paying the full amount. It was really a jump. And if we could get to 300, mm -hmm. we'd feel better about it. Um, having the applicant pay the full rate is problematic because it's hard for us to, um, you know, when we send in a legal ad to the Gazette, they send back what it's going to cost to run the legal ad, but we can't then run out to the applicant and get a check from him to pay the Gazette. We have to, you know, kind of figure out how to administer it. And it's very complicated. And the Conservation Commission does do that, but they their fees are lower because they um, only advertise once. That doesn't really have anything to do with this matter, but it is, it is complicated mm -hmm. for them to chase down the applicants to get them to pay um, and if you wanted to know well in advance of when the legal ad is going to be run, you know, you could do that. You could send the legal ad to the Gazette three or four weeks ahead of time, get the amount that was needed to be paid, then go chase the applicant and have the check in hand. But again, that adds to um, the burden of the planning staff. So we figured that the $300 was kind of a compromise. Um, it's better than it was when we were charging 75. Um, and maybe in a year or two, we'll want to reconsider this, but we figured it was kind of a fair number to start with. So that's kind of how we ended up with this. And, th and there are towns that do require applicants to um, put in their own legal ads, but then you have to worry about, well, are they are they saying it properly? You know, are they covering all the sections of the bylaw that they need to cover? Are they you know, doing, sending it in in time, you know, for the public hearing. So we felt that it was better for us to control that. Um, and there aren't any uh, publications. I know Rob Morris says he does business in Belchertown and other towns where they put um, their legal ads in places like the Reminder, which are a lot less expensive. But Amherst, the Amherst Reminder doesn't really have a robust legal ad section as yet. So that might be an option in the future. But for right now, the Gazette is really the, the game in town where the people actually read. So that's kind of how we've ended up with the Gazette. So I guess that's all I have to say for now. But Rob may have something to offer. I certainly, I would add one thing. Um, that I, I don't think we have to require the exact coverage of the costs, if that's our goal. I think there's no reason to impose additional burden on the staff trying to either chase people down, paying it themselves, or actually going out and seeing what the dollar down to the last dollar is, getting some approximation of whatever the number is is fine with me. So one thing we don't want to do is is put more work on you and your team, uh, Ms. Brestrup uh, and Mr. Mora. But the question is, where is it? So it sounds to me like you're saying that 300 is where the town wants us to be. I, at least at present, is they're comfortable with that. Is that what's in the budget? Is that you would get enough fees from three hundred dollars to in the budget? We have an, a certain amount in our budget to cover legal ads. We went over it significantly. Not, I guess it was in FY twenty two because we had a lot of zoning bylaws as well as applications. So we're trying to catch up to that. We don't want to go over it, but we do have it, a certain amount mm -hmm. in our budget to to pay for legal ads. So if we get a little boost from applicants of three hundred dollars per application, we feel like that is is going to get us to a good place. Okay. Mm -hmm. Other comments from board members, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. O'Connor. Um, <clears throat> Even though I don't vote on this, I'd like to try to understand. So the is the three hundred dollars proposed for those applications which are not single family homes or duplexes, or or, or is it for everything? 
It's for everything. That's you currently know, I, our, I, current, I, our current bylaws are three hundred dollars for everything. Our our current our current bylaw is three hundred dollars for everything. Yes, for legal and the, and the proposal is to have a reduced fee for certain applications below the three hundred. That was one part of it, and then there was some discussion about increasing the other fees to an, a higher number. And 500 was one, or leaving it as it is at three. Other people wanted to have a higher number than that, but yeah. there was discussion I, about increasing it. Yeah, I would, I would be um, inclined. I mean, I, I think it's we need to maybe have a. I mean, I would think of perhaps an intermediate step between 150 or 75 for uh, owner occupied single family and duplexes um, but just to go to 300 for a, a 100 unit apartment building and and charge the same amount for a hundred unit apartment building that you would for uh, a, a, a four unit building, I think would be a problem for me. And I'm, my other concern would be is uh, we're talking, the, the differentiation was with regard to uh, owner occupied single family homes and duplexes. Do we have um, the, the same kind of differentiation has been discussed for certain types of business applications, which we might get um, versus others that are far more extensive. The, you know, uh, I'm, you know, some of the small shops downtown as opposed to a uh, big Y supermarket, for example. Um, I, I think it wouldn't be uh, seen as very fair to, have somebody who has a small, you know, shop in the center of town or in one of the outlying uh, village centers to pay the same application fee as stop and shop, and that's where I I would say we we need to differentiate the business and business application as well. If 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 there are enough applications of that nature, um, but I would. I would be concerned about having a, a much higher fee for, for example, 500. 500 is okay for me for, a, you know, for a 50 to 100 unit apartment building. I'm not too sure that I would feel as comfortable with charging 500 to a small business in a village center or in the downtown. Thank you, Mr. Maxfield. Um, I guess my question here is, is there any way we can just do something like, uh, upon application, if somebody can check off something like, is this commercial, uh, is it something that they, they plan on being a rental, uh, to generate income, or is this going to be something like, uh, an ADU or some type of variance just to the, their own home and just being able to split it off that way. Um, and then having say a cheaper path for somebody who's just. Uh, making some modification to their own home that needs to go through the CBA versus somebody who is doing any sort of uh, uh, commercial development if they're trying to make a, a rental unit or something like that to just split that and have um, have that one be something like a six hundred dollar fee where another one someone needs to yeah something some modification to their house maybe that's like a, a hundred and fifty dollar fee where the town is eating more of the cost on that. Is that something people would be amenable to? And that's something that we can do. You know, I, I'd let other people comment on that. I think we, but my comment would be, we, I think Ms. Marshall made a good point that we, if we're going to go down this road, we probably ought to have something in writing and have, mm -hmm. have and Dylan or Mr. O'Connor, anybody should, should, could propose something at our next meeting or in two weeks, something to that effect. Um, yeah. if we wish but i think there was what i will say mr maxfield is that there was it seemed consensus on a bifurcated simple bifurcated structure because there's already a, there's lots of other fees that are charged as well not just these legal ad fees there's other fees that are charged to the 
to, to people who are, um, you know, depending upon their impact um, on the of the project. So there are uh, differentiated fees. We were looking to do something simple, single family homes and duplex owner occupied duplexes are one thing. Everybody else who's making a profit off the the change or, or, um, would pay a higher fee. And trying to, and trying to balance off how high that would be and trying to bring some additional revenue into the town without being um, without being just try, discouraging um, applications. And that's the other thing. You know, it's all all a balance. So I guess I, I'd like to hear other comments. And then it seems to me we're not ready to make a decision on this this week. Um, it probably makes sense to have app, to have proposals come to us in two weeks or in four weeks, and we can look at it then. But I would welcome any other comments from board members. A uh, comment I'll just make is basically Mr. Gilbert, with Steve, with yeah. um, what what you've been mentioning, and uh, you know, Mr. Maxfield and Ms. Marshall here. I think seeing it in writing is helpful, and that'll give us the opportunity to you know sort of review um, when and where these are you know sort of uh, imposed. All right, I think I saw Ms. Parks nodding her head in agreement as well, as well as a thumbs Great. up. Perfect. Okay, so let's do this. Why don't I suggest that we take this up not in one week, not in our next meeting, but in the meeting after. So we get, and that gives everybody time to work up something, work with Ms. Brestrup and Rob and Steve on coming up with a plan on what you want to work on and then provide it, present it to us in, in two meetings, which I think is, is it uh, March, the next, probably March 3rd, I think would be the meeting that we would um, have because we we have a meeting on the, on the 16th, right? Hold on. Yeah, you're a, a little bit off schedule if you don't oh. mind my saying so. So you have yeah. a meeting on the 16th and then we were thinking that you could cancel the meeting on the 23rd and right. then your next meeting would be the 9th of March because it's really Not the second and the fourth Thursdays of the month. Yeah, so let's, let's shoot for... Let's shoot this for this topic to be discussed on the 9th of March. Okay. Does that work for everybody? All right. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, it, it, I think it works for me, but I, I, I'm not sure I understood what you said. Were you asking um, members to submit their ideas to Ms. Brestrup or she's heard them here or? or no, no, oh, good. to work, however you want to do it. You, okay. I'm sure you can work with Ms. Brestrup to, okay. to to work it out, but come back to us on the ninth if you have a specific proposal with something in writing, and it'd be easy to, for us to uh, to consider it at that point. Make sense? All right, good enough. Great. Um, the next order of business is um, a presentation from the staff on two proposals for zoning changes. One deals with duplexes, triplexes, and townhomes, and the other, which is proposed by the uh, by um, commission, town council people, um, Haneke and DeAngelist, and a second one, which is already adopted, which changed the treatment of certain um, uh, food establishments, restaurants, and bars. So I've asked Rob and Chris and Stephen to, to prepare a presentation so that we can understand this. My And I think the first thing would be to, to discuss what the status of this proposal is. I saw it at the first of, around the first of the year. I know the, the town, um, the CRC committee, Community Resources Committee has, uh, has had this referred to them and to the planning board. I've watched one planning board hearing on it. There's another one which I have not watched. And I think the CRC committee has had one or two hearings and they have another hearing coming up on this, uh, the new zoning proposal. So that would be helpful to, uh, to give us a, a status report when it's likely to be looked at by the town council and, and, and uh, what our role in that process is, and then go through the, the proposal itself. So. Chris, Steve, or Rob, whoever is is um, going to take the lead on this, it's we look forward to your presentation. Okay, well, I think I'll take the lead, and then um, Rob and or Steve can jump in if they are recognized by the um, chair. 
Um, I am going to give you kind of the quick and dirty version of this. And Mandy Johanneke is coming next um, Thursday, the 16th, to give you a more formal presentation. So mm -hmm. my intention is to um, introduce you to this topic. And then um, you've received a lot of information in your packet, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. So anyway, I made up a little, um, a little script here, and uh, Steve is going to help me. Um, as we go along. So my name is Chris Brestrup and I'm the planning director and I want to introduce you to this uh, proposed zoning amendment on housing types. You received material on this in your packets for this meeting and the planning board has also received material. Um, the zoning amendment was first sent to town council by two councillors in January and on January 6th town council voted to refer the amendment to the planning board and the Community Resources Committee for public hearings. Um, I'm not here tonight to convince you to support this zoning amendment. I think that Mandy Jo you know, will be in that uh, role next week. I'm just here to introduce it to you and to explain it to you. Um, the work of the ZBA will be affected by the changes proposed by this amendment. And I believe that Mr. Judge recognized that fact. Um, and for the most part, the work of the ZBA will be reduced um, if this zoning amendment or parts of it are adopted. So I've already said that at your coming meeting on February 16th, um, you'll receive a more full-blown presentation of this. Somebody's um, screen, oh, yeah. I think Steve is uh, trying to help me out. <laughs> um, let's see, anyway. Um, so Mandy Johanneke, when she meets with you on the 16th, will tell you why she thinks this zoning amendment is necessary. I'll give you a brief synopsis of that. Um, so the zoning amendment was proposed by two counselors, Mandy Johanneke and Pat DeAngelis. The reason they proposed the amendment is to increase the number of housing units in town and to make it easier to get permits to build housing units. They are focusing on small housing types like duplexes, triplexes, converted dwellings and townhouses. And the reason they're making the proposal is that they believe that housing is not affordable in Amherst, and I'm sure that many of us believe that too. And they also believe that the lack of affordability has a disproportionate effect on low-income, middle-income people and members of the what is known as the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So councillors Haneke and DeAngelis are proposing to streamline the permitting process for various types of small housing developments, hoping that a more streamlined process will encourage people to build more housing and enable more low-income, middle-income, and members of the BIPOC community in Amherst to live in Amherst and to rent and own property. Um, some of the changes that are proposed um, would take housing types out of the ZBA jurisdiction and put them into the jurisdiction of the planning board. And some of the changes will take permitting out of the jurisdiction of both the planning board and the zoning board of appeals and put them into the jurisdiction of the building commissioner. So first I wanted to look at um, use categories, but before we do that, I'd like to look at page four of the PowerPoint presentation that you received as part of your packet. Um, and uh, Mr. McCarthy, Steve McCarthy has brought up page four. So I wanted to describe to you um, the different types of permits that we use in town. There are basically four of them. There's yes, which means it's allowed. You don't have to go through any land use permitting process. There's site plan review, which is a process by which the planning board reviews things on the exterior of a building, but they don't really review what's inside the building. There's a special permit, which is generally from the Zoning Board of Appeals, and the Zoning Board of Appeals gets deeply into the use of the um, proposal as well as what's going on on the site. And then there's no, no, you can't do that in this zoning district. So um, the yes is, we call it by right. It means the use is appropriate anywhere in the zoning district. Um, the building inspector, the building commissioner issues a building permit for the use if the zoning requirements are met. In other words, if the setback requirements and the lot area requirements are met. Um, there's no public hearing involved and abutters are not notified. And um, to give you an example of a use that is, you know, that 
uh, fits this category. It's a single family home in a residential district, but also things like forestry, orchards, conservation in all zones are allowed um, by yes. And you can look through your bylaw and in the use table, which is, I think it's section 3.3 .3, use categories. And you can see um, that there are a lot of uses in the very beginning of it that are yes. The next um, type of permit is a site plan review from the planning board. And some people call this by right, but it's really by right with a review with a land use permit. And the land use permit is called site, site plan review approval. Um, so it, uh, essentially it's a use that is appropriate anywhere in the zoning district, but the town wants to have input into what is it going to look like? How many parking spaces is it, going to, is it going to have? Will there be amenities on site? What about the planting plan? Um, so the planning board holds a public hearing to review the project. Um, it can. It really is only denied when there isn't enough information given in the application for the planning board to make a decent judgment, or if the project doesn't meet the requirements of the zoning bylaw or doesn't meet the criteria in section 11.24. Um, generally speaking, there's no appeal period. Of course, anybody can bring anything to court, but generally we don't have appeals from site plan review decisions. Um, there is a public hearing and there is a notification of everybody who owns property within 300 feet that there's a public hearing and they can come and make uh, comments. Um, so it assumes that the use is suitable in the zoning district and it also assumes that the site plan review will be granted. Um, and this is a, a typical type of permit throughout the bylaw. Um, the third type is in is a special permit, and this is generally granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And this is discretionary. That's why it's called a special permit. So the Zoning by, uh, Board of Appeals has the right to approve or deny this type of um, application. Um, it is generally that the use is appropriate in some parts of the zoning district, but may not be appropriate in other parts because it may have an effect on adjacent properties that's uh, not, a, not a, a, a good effect. Um, you have to make findings to grant the permit, um, and the findings have to do with suitability of the location and compatibility with existing uses, um, whether or not it's going to inconvenience abutters and whether it's in harmony with what's going on around it. There is a 20 day appeal period after a decision is filed with the town clerk. And um, this type of permit acknowledges that the use may or may not be suitable, and that thereby it's discretionary and it requires a careful look at what's being proposed. This is also typical throughout the bylaw. And the fourth thing is no, you can't build whatever it is you're proposing to build in this district. So it just means it's not allowed. Um, and generally speaking, um, there aren't that many uses that aren't allowed, but it depends It depends on the district. So um, this uh, PowerPoint presentation notes that single family homes are not allowed in non-residential districts. You do find the occasional single family home in a business district, but that's really an anomaly left over from a previous uh, time. Um, and there are certain business uses that aren't allowed in residential districts. Um, the proponents note that radioactive waste storage is only allowed in the LI district, which may be of interest to you. Um, I don't think we have any such storage here, um, but there are certain uses that are definitely no. So, okay, thank you, Steve, for letting me uh, make that explanation. Um, both Steves. Um, we should also take a look at description of the residential zoning district. So if Steve McCarthy can bring that up, that would be helpful. So this describes um, what the residential zoning districts are. And some of them are um, very close in to town center and, and some of them are very far out. And so let's go through these. There's the RG zoning district, which is the general residence. It's um, supposed to be, these are descriptions that are taken from the zoning bylaw, generally speaking. They may not be word for word, but it's uh, the, the spirit of these is taken from the zoning bylaw. Um, they're medium to high density. They're near the town center. They're between the university and the town center, and they're convenient to services, facilities, institutions, or employment opportunities. So uh, an example of this would be um, the High Street, North Whitney Street area. 
um, Gray Street around the high school, that's general residence. Um, also Lincoln Ave and I believe Sunset Ave is also a uh, general residence, although you're probably starting to get towards RN when you're getting farther to the west. So let's just say Lincoln would be RG. Um, <clears throat> the, the next one is RVC, which is Residential Village Center, and that tends to cluster around um, the, the village centers such as North Amherst Village Center and Pomeroy Village Center. And um, I think there might be some down in the, actually, I won't go any further than that. Pomeroy and North Amherst. Um, so the resident, there are residential neighborhoods within and adjacent to village centers. They have medium density, a limited mix of residential and office uses, and they provide a transition between the business village center district and surrounding residential districts. Um, RN is the neighborhood residents, and these are medium density areas. They're appropriate for um, lands that are adjacent to higher density residential districts and they're near arterial or primary residential streets. An example of this would be um, Echo Hill, if you know Echo Hill and um, Heatherstone Road, which is adjacent to uh, Pelham Road. And so that's a, it's a fairly dense neighborhood, but it's not as dense as neighborhoods in the RG zoning district. RO is outlying residents, and these are farther from the center of town. Um, they're lower density residential areas. They tend to be along uh, roadways. Um, many of them are kind of the frontage property in farming districts, and they're a transition between low density RLD and medium density RN. So again, there a lot of them are along uh, main roadways such as Bay Road. Although um, you would also find that the uh, Orchard Valley neighborhood, um, it's uh, Longmeadow Drive and that area is in the RO zoning district, even though it's, it's fairly dense, but it's not as dense as, as say Echo Hill. Um, and then there's RLD, which is the lowest density residential zoning district that we have. And those tend to be in the farming districts and they tend to not be right on the road. You usually have a strip of RN or RO along the road and then RLD is behind that. And those are mostly along um, Southeast Street, Northeast Street, Bay Road and those um, outlying rural areas. So now that you know all about residential zoning districts and all about um, permitting. Let's go to the chart that Steve has that is a one page chart. You can bring that up, Steve, and we'll show you some changes that are being proposed by this um, proposal. It's the chart that doesn't, that's it. Yeah, it doesn't have too many words on it. So here we are with um, the residential uses listed down the left side of the page. And then across the top are all of the zoning districts that I just talked about. And we're really gonna focus on the residential zoning districts, which are the four columns to the left, but there are a few others where um, residential uses are allowed. So what the, what the proponents of this zoning amendment are trying to do is um, sort of take each um, use category and make it slightly easier to get a permit. And in some cases, they're not just jumping one step easier, they're jumping two steps easier. So uh, one family dwellings, they're not changing at all, but owner occupied duplexes, they wanna make those as easy to build as single family, uh, one family detached dwellings. So in other words, if you're living in the house and it's a duplex, uh, the proponents of this zoning amendment feel that you should be able to build it just with a building permit. So in the RO, RLD, RN, RVC, and RG districts, the um, mechanism for uh, getting approval would be a building permit. And that's why this says Y for yes. So in all of those districts, it would be Y for yes. What you're seeing just below the Y in the case of the RO, RLD, and RN, are some letters in parentheses. And the letters in parentheses refer to uh, developments in the um, Aquifer Recharge Protection District, which is a district that's 
kind of large and it's down in the southeast corner of the town and it's really around the Lawrence Swamp, but there's a lot of area aside from Lawrence Swamp that's also in the R A R P district. So um, what the proponents are saying is rather than uh, saying no to building an owner occupied duplex in the ARP district, they would like to see those by site plan review. So you would have some uh, planning board review of what's being proposed, how much parking, you know, how much um, paved area, whether there's planting there and all of those kinds of things. Um, moving Chris, down. Can I just stop you for just a quick second? And I, sure. I'm not as familiar with the aquifer district. Does the, what other agency in town or commission in town takes a look at, has a responsibility for protecting the, aqu the aquifer districts? Is it the ComCon, the Conservation Commission, or or is, or is there another um, aid, is there another body that will, will judge whether a, a house or a, a use is going to uh, imperil the aquifer? The um, Water Supply Protection Committee um looks at the aquifers and what's going on okay. in and around them but i'm not sure that they would get involved in um reviewing um something that is being proposed there if it's a, only a single family house or a duplex um we could ask them to as part of our um review process mm -hmm. if people thought that was important and so you know we could bring them into it but generally speaking they they wouldn't um get into the site plan review. We do send all of our applications to uh, the DPW, to both the um, superintendent of public works and the town engineer. So if they spot something that doesn't look right, you know, they would respond, but of course they're very busy, so they might not notice everything. So I think that's that's a good question that maybe we need some further review or some, you know, particular um, listing of, the Water Supply Protection Committee on um, projects that are in the ARP district. So I apologize for interrupting you. I'll, I'll let you go. That's okay. <laughs> yep. I'll make a note of that. ARP review. Um, so the idea of the proponents is to make the all of these things a slightly easier in the ARP. I think initially, um, most of the ARP was not on sewer. It was all on septic. And I think that there would be a relationship between, you know, having a septic system and having, you know, density yeah. areas that were in the ARP. Um, yeah. And now a lot of those areas are on sewer. So that's been taken into consideration here. Um, so affordable duplexes, that's a particular um type of duplex that has one of the two units at least affordable and that would be that would be on the um, state housing inventory so um, it's kind of hard to get uh, duplexes on the state housing inventory although we do have a couple of them we have one two of them that were built by habitat for humanity one is on east pleasant street and one is on north pleasant street so um, they would then in, instead of having site plan review in these residential zoning districts, they would, um, they're proposed to be a yes in all of those zoning districts. Um, let's see, non owner occupied duplex is the next one. And we all know what that is. So those are currently required to be special permit in um, three out of four, uh, or actually four out of five residential districts. And the proposal is to make them by site plan review by the planning board rather than special permit by the zoning board of appeals. And then in the BN zoning district, which is a business neighborhood district, um, these non owner occupied duplexes would also be allowed by site plan review instead of special permit. Um, then the proponents of this zoning amendment are um, hoping to add another use category called triplex. So currently, a three unit um, building would be considered either a townhouse or an apartment. And we've long talked about creating a, another category 
and allowing triplexes to exist similarly to duplexes and not have them be lumped in with apartments and townhouses. So that's what the proponents are doing here. And they, they're saying that the triplex should be allowed in all the zoning districts that are residential by site plan review and that they shouldn't be, well, they're not allowing them in a fraternity residential district and that makes sense. And they're not allowing them in the business districts except for business neighborhood, which is BN. And then they're not allowing them in the other business districts, which are listed to the right of this chart. Um, I'm almost finished with this part. Mm -hmm. um, converted dwelling is a kind of, um, what should I say? I, it's a different, it's a different, it's a horse of a different color, I guess you could call it. Um, it's got a kind of confusing um, description in the zoning bylaw, but essentially it's a, an existing house that is um, able to be converted into uh, two or more dwelling units without making significant changes to the exterior. Or it could be a detached building like a garage or a barn that is built before 1964. Um, so that's what a converted dwelling is. And right now, converted dwellings are only allowed by special permit in all of the residential zoning districts, except for RF, where it's not allowed at all. Um, and the proponents are saying that this should be allowed by site plan review by the planning board. So um, every time we're saying something goes from special permit to site plan review, it goes from zoning board of appeals review to planning board review. Um, and then converted dwelling is allowed by special permit in the limited business, village center business and neighborhood business by special permit. And the proponents are saying, make those by site plan review as well. I think Mandy will give you more of a sense of why they are making these um, proposals. I'm just telling you what they're proposing. Um, townhouses, townhouses are, um, are buildings that have between three and tw uh, 10 units in a building. So um, townhouses are generally not allowed in the outlying uh, residential districts, such as the RO, the RLD, and the RN currently. So they're not allowed along Bay Road. They're not allowed in Orchard Valley. They're not allowed in Echo Hill. I think they wouldn't be allowed in um, Amherst, Amherst Woods. Um, which would be RN, but now the proponents are saying, no, those should be allowed by special permit. In some places, it might make sense to have a townhouse in those locations, but you can see N in parentheses, which means in the case of a, a property that's in the ARP, they wouldn't be allowed. It would be a no in the ARP district. And then in um, residential village center and general residence, they would be allowed by site plan review. And in some of the business districts, they would also be allowed either by special permit or by site plan review. In the BG, which is a general business district downtown, they are proposing to um, change the permitting from an easier path to a more um, strict path from site plan review to special permit, because the idea is we don't want the BG, which is very small, to be taken up by um, housing developments unless they include commercial space. Um, and then there's a, a final kind of oddball uh, type of, of dwelling, which is called subdividable dwelling. And um, this was created for one particular property owner. And I'm going to say it was probably about 20 years ago that this was created. And it's um, essentially a converted dwelling that can go back and forth between being a converted dwelling or being a single family dwelling without having to come back to any board to declare it one or the other. And as I said, it's only been used once. And so the building commissioner and the planning department have recommended that this use is not very useful and it should just be eliminated. So they're proposing to eliminate that use. Um, what else do I have to say? Um, so, so for some of these uses, could you switch to the chart that has a lot of words on it, Steve? Um, I'll just make a few more notes about this. There would be standards and conditions added for certain uses. 
um, descriptions of two family and three family dwellings would change and they would be more coordinated with each other. Um, owner occupied duplexes would re require a deed restriction um, that would be placed in the registry of deeds to let future owners know that uh, the property is required to be owner occupied. Um, this is currently done for accessory dwelling units and um, it's worked so pretty well so far. Um, Non-owner occupied duplexes would have certain conditions placed on them, similar to those placed on accessory dwelling units. Um, affordable duplexes would also have standards and conditions. Triplexes would have, uh, and townhouses, um, no, triplexes would have standard and conditions. Townhouses, there would be no changes. Um, and I said we've eliminated subdividable dwellings. Um, let's see, what else do I have to say? So. Um, there are just a few more housekeeping things so that um, in Article 4, which uh, is um, it regulates development methods like subdivisions, cluster subdivisions, PURDs, and open space community developments, those sections of the bylaw, which are in Article 4, would be changed to add a triplex so that you wouldn't just be allowed to have a duplex, but you would also be allowed to have a triplex. And then Article 9, which deals with non-conforming lots, would be changed to add reference to three family dwellings. So um, I'm just going to wrap up and say I encourage you to think of questions and comments to offer to Mandy Jo, Haneke, and Pat DeAngelis when they meet with you next week. So read through the material that you received in your packet. It'll make more sense to you as you read through it again. And then um, I'm able to take questions tonight if um, Mr. Judge feels that would be worthwhile, and I can answer them to the best of my ability. Um, but knowing that I was not the initiator of this, and the planning department was not the initiator of this zoning amendment, it was really the two counselors, so they, they know it backwards and forwards, and I know it as well as um, you do by now. <laughs> so. Th thank you, Ms. Brestrup. I really appreciate you going through all this and um, coming up, getting up to speed on something that I know the town staff did not um, did not initiate, uh, but trying to get um, and it's exactly what I wanted to have done is a um, an analysis um, by an, by you guys that would help us try to evaluate this. I had one question. The last thing you talked about was non-conforming lots and triplexes can you explain what that was is it you said it was in in article was it article four it's article nine article nine and it's really it's in your packet and it's um yeah. there's uh, this section that has a lot of writing that you're looking at now and if steve would flip to the last page of that um, scroll to the last page of it. I think it's page 11 of this um, section here. There you go. So non-conforming um, lots is a section of the bylaw. And there's one particular section where um, we're just adding, instead of just having one family and two family uh, residential uses talked about here, we are adding three family, or the proponents, I should say, are adding three family here, just to um, make that clear. And this section, I think, has something to do with um, what- Yeah, what is chapter 40A, section six? Oh, chapter 40A uh, is the- is that, uh, Chapter 40A- That's comprehensive, is, that's comprehensive permits, isn't it? No, section, I think section no? six is the uh, non-conforming, um, and special permit uh, section, but Rob, if Rob is here, I'm not as um, completely facile with uh, Chapter 40A as Rob is. You're correct, Chris. That's that's the section for non pre-existing non-conforming uh, lots and uses and structures. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Rob, um, may I ask him a question? Does this um, mm -hmm. section 9.10 of the zoning bylaw, is that the section that describes what the building commissioner can approve um, and that doesn't require going to a board? Can you talk about that a little bit? So 9.1 9 9 is just for lots, non-conforming lots. Okay. Um, 
9.2 is what, um, did, did they make an adjustment for 9.2? No. No, okay. Just 9.1. All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, this uh, it's a pretty minimal change. It only has to do with a non-conforming lot. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right. So anything else? I would have one quick suggestion, and I know this, Chris, this, um, and Ms. Brestrup, this is not your document. You didn't create this document, but the, if I think it would be really helpful to have pages on it, page numbers on the document. Um, if it's, if it's, if it's 44 pages and it's really hard to run through if there's a, a way to, if you can um, have that read numerated some way, it makes it a lot easier to try to identify it. I know that that if this is the proponent's document, not yours, but it's it's a complicated thing otherwise. We're, we're talking about then describing pages with lots of writing on it versus, <laughs> and that's, you know, that's hard, hard to decide which that is. So page numbers would be great. Um, I'd like to open this up to members of the, of the board to see if they have questions about this um, or, if, or if there's things that you'd like to have answered prior to the um, meeting next week. Ms. Parks. Um, I, it's just a point of clarification. I'm looking at the um, different types of permits and I'm looking at the site plan review. And down near the bottom, it says that there's a public hearing and a butter notice. And I'm just wondering where do those occur? Are those in the paper or is there, where's is, where is the public hearing? The public hearing, may I answer that? Yes. So the public hearing. Ahead. It's the same as a ZBA public hearing. It occurs, currently it occurs on a Zoom meeting. Um, and the legal ad for that would be in the Gazette, the Daily Hampshire Gazette. And then um, a notice would be sent via the US mail to all the people who own property within 300 feet of the property that's being considered. So it's the same process as the Zoning Board of Appeals goes through. You also publish your um, notice of a public hearing in the Gazette, and then you send um, notices to the abutters, the property owners, um, within 300 feet. So this would be a planning board meeting? And the site plan review is a planning board meeting, yes. So it, But okay. it follows the same process that the ZBA special permit process follows. The main difference is that there's, um, you don't really have as much opportunity to say no um, in a site plan review as the ZBA does in a special permit process, which is discretionary. And then the other difference is that there isn't a specific uh, appeal period for site plan review, where there is an appeal period that is specified for the special permit that the ZBA does, and that's a 20-day appeal period. Okay. So, so j just so I know, so at planning board meetings, is there a portion of the meeting where you are talking about all the projects that have come up for review? I haven't been to a planning board meeting, so I, I don't know what that looks like. May I answer that? Yeah. Oh, yes, Ms. Preston, go ahead. Yep. So um, the planning board has a, has a schedule or an agenda that's similar to the zoning board agenda. Um, in fact, we actually put a time on our um, public hearings. So if someone were proposing something that required a site plan review, it would be listed on the agenda and it would be given a certain time and it would be a public hearing that would be opened. Um, and then the applicant would give a presentation and the planning board members would ask questions and then the public could make comments. And once all the comments and questions are answered, the planning board closes the public hearing and then it goes through a list of criteria similar to your 10.38, but the planning board uses 11.24 and the planning board makes findings based on that. And then they also put conditions on things. So it's very similar in terms of the process, but the planning board doesn't really look at the use of the project as carefully as the zoning board does. And um, yeah, so okay. I'll, I'll stop. All right, thank you. <laughs> Mr. So I, th I think you just did a lot of the, you've answered a lot of questions that I was just going to ask, ask Chris, but they do have an essential difference between the site plan review and the special permit. 
as listed in the presentation, is that the site plan review assumes approval, or you go in with a higher, higher certainty of approval, and the um, special permit is purely discretionary depending on what the, the board decides. You, they don't have 10, they don't have 10 points. We have the same notification to abutters and public notice. They don't have to use 10.38 or 10.3 as we do. They have a different standard. Are, do they have, I'm not as familiar obviously with 11 and that's something I think we should uh, all review before the next meeting is to see what, what uh, requirements and findings they have to make. I'm assuming they have to make the same kind of findings that, do they have to make the same kind of findings that we have to make under 10.38? The findings are very similar. Um, the wording is different, but the essential topics that are covered are almost identical. Um, I don't think there's something in 10.38 that isn't included in 11.24, although maybe Rob could correct me on that. Okay. Well, Mr. Chairman. And, yep, and can you, and just, just a second. And can and can they? One of the things we do in the ZBA is we often impose conditions on applic on applicants and as a requirement of the approval of the special permit. Is that routinely done by the zone by the planning board? Or are they empowered to do that? Yes, they are, and they do often uh, come up with uh, many many conditions. You know, twenty, thirty, forty, or more. Especially for the, big projects, yep. And when they deal with single family homes or duplexes, have they done the same thing? I know a lot of their, their work is big projects. Um, is, 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 do they tend to impose conditions on uh, smaller developments or single family homes, duplexes? They do. In fact, the one that I mentioned before, um, 51 Spalding Street, just went through the planning board. Um, it had been a ZBA project, but it shifted to the planning board and the planning board did impose um, many conditions. I think there might've been more than 20 conditions on it. And if you'd be interested, I could send you that decision. It was just recently um, signed by the uh, planning board members and I'd be happy to send it to you so you could see what a planning board process is like. Um, why don't I do that? That might be helpful. Okay, that'd be helpful. And so then, um, all right, I want to make sure other people can ask questions. Um, I see that Ms. Marshall's hand is up. Yeah. Um, first of all, and, and maybe it's, I don't know, I need some convincing or I'm just not familiar enough with the planning board, but the differences in the process do not seem enormous to me. So, So maybe it's the the town councilors um, who will need to persuade me that this does in fact make it moving from SP to SPR makes a process easier. Um, yes, our special permits are discretionary, but we, we can only deny it, my understanding it is based on the findings. We can't, I mean, we don't have discretion just to not approve things we don't like. Right. right. Um, so, so that's one issue for me. But, but a more specific question that perhaps Ms. Bressert can answer is, um, what is the if it's if it can be done briefly, maybe what is the difference between converted dwelling and ADUs, which I know we've also tried to make easier recently because some of the examples you described for converted dwelling, I thought those were accessory dwelling units, so. Well, ADUs, there's a whole new section of the bylaw on ADUs and they're in the accessory um, uses section. I think it's 5.011 or something like that. But anyway, um, it, it's quite extensive and there are three different kinds of ADUs. One is that's totally contained within the building in which it is built. Mm -hmm. The second is it's an addition to the building that it is connected to. And the third is that it's a standalone. But in any case, in order to be um, approved only by the building commissioner with a building permit, it has to be, um, it has to meet certain criteria which are listed in the bylaw. And it also has to be a thousand square feet or less. 
And if it deviates from any of that, then it has to go to a special permit, which I believe is a ZBA special permit. But if you're interested, you could um, look online in the zoning bylaw and read that section, that new section of the bylaw about ADUs, and that explains it. Um, but I agree that it can be confusing because you might have a garage that somebody wants to turn into a converted dwelling. Mm -hmm. But currently, I think if you, uh, so another thing about ADUs is that the property has to be owner occupied. So if you had a property that had a garage and you wanted to convert it into a dwelling unit, but the property wasn't okay. going to be owner occupied, you would choose to go the converted dwelling route because I don't believe <laughs> converted dwellings have to be owner occupied, although I could be wrong about that. Um, and the ADU property has to be owner occupied. So you could have a garage that you change into a dwelling unit to make it into an ADU. And as long as it's less than a thousand square feet or a thousand square feet or less, and the property is owner occupied, then it can be an ADU and be approved by the building commissioner. Does that make sense? Well, the only part that stuck with me <laughs> as maybe distinguishing the two is that if you wanna have an ADU, you have to live on the property yourself. And maybe that is not true for converted dwellings, but otherwise it seems like as far as the structure is concerned, they could be the same thing. It could be a, a dwelling, a smaller dwelling unit within the original house. And it just depends on whether the owner is living there or not. Is that, did I understand that? That may be a question for Rob. That may be a good Rob. question for Rob. Mr. Okay. Mora. Yeah, the, the owner occupancy is one and the other is the limiting size at a thousand square feet. So a converted dwelling can be bigger. It certainly can be smaller, uh, but it but it can also be bigger than a thousand square feet. Thank you. Um, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, yes, I, um, my approach to to this discussion is uh, fairly simple and straightforward. Um, um, I believe that, I think we all have, may have individual opinions about the proposal or the proposals, um, but um, as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, I, I don't feel that it's, it's a matter that should be um, discussed by the Zoning Board of Appeals. I think it's actually, it involves our having a discussion about the merits of, of a legislative enactment really violates um, Article 30 of Part 1 of the Massachusetts Constitution, which asks, which basically says that the legislative, executive, and judicial branches of government should stick to their business and so forth. Um, the, the analogy that occurs to me about this discussion is wh whether Congress might invite the Supreme Court to have a discussion about whether with regard to campaign finance or voting rights, um, this, that they asked the Supreme Court's opinion about whether the Congress should enact under um, Article 3, Section 2, Paragraph 2, the, the second sentence, restrict the Supreme Court's jurisdiction over particular pieces of legislation addressing certain issues. I mean, this is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I have no opinion about the legislative activities of the town. As a member of the zoning board, I have an opinion as a citizen, but as a member of the zoning board, I don't think um, it's my business to have a zoning board member opinion about legislative activities. The planning board is certainly, in in fact, they are the initiator of these proposals, but I don't believe it's um, 
it quite frankly is the business of the Zoning Board of Appeals to weigh in on what I think is a purely a legislative matter. And um, I think we could save ourselves. This is very different from, um, from, uh, sec from number B, where legislation has been enacted. And I think the staff would like us to understand the, the new by sections of the bylaw so that we can um, enforce it in a fair and understanding way. That I have no problem with, but I think asking the zoning board opinion about proposed legislation, I think um, really puts us in, uh, 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 I think an untenable position. And I think that the um, proponents would be better served by um, uh, addressing other bodies the public in general and so forth. And I think we would be better served by, um, with regard to changes to our jurisdiction and so forth, um, maintaining our silence. Um, I don't believe that it's our business to, to um, have a zoning board opinion about this matter. Um, we can have personal opinions, I think, I think probably everyone the zoning board will end up having a personal opinion. And the proper way for us to deal with it is probably to express those opinions to the city councilors who represent us um, and, um, and, you know, and act as ordinary citizens. But acting as a zoning board, I think, is not what we should be doing with regard to proposed legislation. Unless okay. we, all right. I'm, I understand your your point, Mr. O'Connor. Thank you. Um, is there other comments from board members? Ms. Parks. I just have a question that I've wondered about for a long time, and I have looked in the zoning bylaw and I don't see it, but is there a minimum amount of square feet in a unit per person? Um, I'm just wondering if such a thing exists. Not in the zoning bylaw, but I believe it exists in the uh, building code. No, the state sanitary code. Excuse me. Maybe Mr. Mora could address that yeah, issue. Mr. Mora. The, uh, the square footage per occupant is uh, part of the health codes, the state sanitary code. The building code defines this minimum square footage for spaces, how big a kitchen, how big a bedroom needs to be, but per occupant is the uh, state sanitary code. Do, do you know what that amount is? Uh, not off the top of my head. It's something like a hundred square feet plus 60 per additional occupant. There's, there's some ratio like that, but I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. Okay. I just, this, this kind of question comes up for me when I'm thinking about people converting garages or, and I have a chicken coop in my backyard, you know, it's kind of like what, it, you know, what's the minimum size that you can put for, uh, for unrelated adults. And so I would just be interested in, in that number. So I, I can look it up. I can look up the state sanitary code. Thank you. I, I think, yeah, I think it's 150 per and then something like a, a hundred for each additional. 150, 150 square feet per person and 100 additional for each, uh, so 250 one, for two? 150 for the initial and then a hundred. Yep. And 250 for, for two. Correct. Okay. But you know, granted, that's not um, livable spaces, right? That, that's not a, that's not bedroom. I, I would just yeah. say that you know, compared to the size of a dorm room, I think that's what we're you know, I think that's kind of what the thinking is when we're talking about the possibility of creating more housing for students is yeah. comparing the size of a dorm room, which is pretty small, for two people. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Kanam, I want to give other people a chance, and we'll get back. Sure. We will get to you, sure. Yes. Okay. Mr. I, if Mr. Maxfield or Mr. Gilbert, do you have comments? Or Ms. Parks, do you have any further comment? 
Only comment I'll make is uh, thank you for taking the time to put together, um, you know, this document. This is a lot of work. And, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot of positive in here. There's, there's a lot to be questioned. Um, and I think, you know, we'll, we'll come to discussion on this um, in, I think, the next two ZBAs, it sounded like. But um, needless to say, obviously, a lot of time and effort has been put into here. And, you know, I, I for one, am, um, am always on the side of the fence of sort of questioning some of the zoning law and, you know, making sure that it, it works in a contemporary fashion. And I think uh, this at least opens up a discussion um, to consider that. So thank you for the time and effort here. All right. Oh, Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, I'll just also uh, kind of echo what just uh, Mr. Gilbert said. Thanks a lot for uh, taking the time to do this. It is good to know uh, really kind of uh, changes that are coming down the pipes and how it's going to be impacting us at the ZBA. So we can really start thinking about that now. Um, Kind of what's going to be coming to us so i appreciate the time and the presentation mr o'connor yeah i think that the um some of the minimum standards in the state sanitary code involve the num the amount of square footage in in uh, in bedrooms and um i think um th there may be two there may be two standards one for the total unit, but I'm not sure that there is such a thing, and and the other for bedrooms, um, and um, but it, you know, if it would be helpful to the members, I think we could, it would be useful to have that information in front of us, uh, in front of the, the zoning board the next time this is discussed. But I, th I think what's in the state sanitary code has to do with square footage in bedrooms. As has been said, I appreciate the, the effort that the staff has put in to try to explain this. I wanna be clear that the staff didn't create this document, I don't think. I think this document was created by the, the proponents, um, but they're interpreting the document that was given to them. So. Um, that took a considerable amount of work. I have looked through it as well, and it's it's um, it it does require some a lot of effort uh, if you're not intimately familiar with the zoning law bylaw in, the, in Amherst to to go through this. So I pre, I I want to echo the the things that the rest of my colleagues have said. Thanks for for putting this together. My impression of this is that there's lots of there's real implications for our our uh, purpose and jurisdiction as a as a bza as a zoning board of appeals and i think it's important for us to understand and so that we can respond if asked by the town council or by the town uh, the crc committee we can respond in, in an informed manner as to what we think the effect of this would be that's currently um what I hope that the next meeting will do is give us a better sense of what the proponents are, how they feel this will accomplish their goals. And I think it's our responsibility to try to inform them because to the extent that they are unfamiliar with the work that we do, because nobody's gonna be as familiar as we are uh, because we do it all the time and they have other things that they're doing. And people can help to educate them if they need it as to what, um, what our process is and um, what how we feel the process of a special permit currently uh, benefits the town if we do so that's what i hope to achieve in the next couple of uh, meetings and i hope that we have more information from um, from the proponents and i look forward to hearing more about it what i would like to do unless there's other comments from the board i'd like to open it up to public comment um, this is a um, we have time tonight we're not running over um, this is not I'm not making any decisions tonight. Uh, Ms. Parks. Ms. Parks. I just, I just wanted to ask, I mean, are we voting on this? No. Um, no. So we're just we're learning about this. And next time right. it's just going to be a proposal about it. Um, next time we're going to hear from the proposal. I'm sorry, Ms. Parks, but I didn't make it clear. There's no there's no motion before the ZBA at this time. And we're, all we're doing is learning about the proposal. It affects our work. And we want to know about it. And the second thing is next week, we want to hear from the proponents of, of why they are proposing this and why 
do they think it will work? At that point, you know, people could suggest that we take a position, but that's not what we're asked to do. It is not our core function is to do that. Or that would be as a body that advises the town council uh, if we want to do that. But that's not what's it hasn't been remanded to us by the city council and it hasn't been uh, we haven't been authorized to make a recommendation. So as the planning board has been. Okay. okay. And then I would also throw out um, that on Monday at seven o'clock, there are the community resource committee is holding sessions about uh, about these changes. Um, in case anyone's interested in well, checking that I, out. I think those are the rent is that on Monday, that's a rental um, new rental um, program. Ms. Yeah. Parks, and I think on the 16th, the same day as our hearing, yeah. that they're going to have this matter up before them as the, the CRC committee has this matter on the zoning uses before them again, I think. Yes, Is that you're right? right. You're right. It's the 16th for the the zoning. Right. Um, and maybe, okay, an additional date. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, the okay. only other come, I just have one last comment, and that is sure. I, I can't find it right now, but I know in here somewhere within the presentation, they talk about uh, one of the issues or one of the reasons they're thinking about this is because of a zoning board decision. And I'm just wondering if we can remember, try to remember what that decision was. Yeah, I, did, I noted that as well, that there was, there was evidently a decision that is an example of a process that troubled the, uh, the proponents. The only one I can think of is, was a converted, it was a garage that was gonna be converted to um, a, sink, a, 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 a second unit, second dwelling unit on a piece of property over by the university. Right. And we had, there were several hearings on it. Um, it was, it was uh, very contentious in the neighborhood. Um, and the, the applicant, um, eventually withdrew the application after I think three here I think we had three hearings I forget the exact address of that that's the only one I can uh, it's they, that seemed to resonate with me is that what they may have been uh, the the case that may have been alluded to there, there was another one where someone was uh, talking about putting a studio uh, in their uh, yard as a detached dwelling and then uh, it was changed into a, a kind of a bedroom or uh, an apartment. Yeah, that was a that was over on. Um, yes, that's true. That yeah. was over on. That was earlier, but that was uh, also withdrawn. There was an ADU. There was going to be a separate yeah. Yeah. A separate unit ADU that was withdrawn after some con that, again. That was a controversial um, application, but it was that was withdrawn. I hadn't thought about that one, Ms. Parks. That's right. Yeah, I just that was when I read that 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 kind of stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Guys, right, so we have two. Uh, any other comments from board members before I go to the public comment? Okay. We have two. One first, uh, Councillor Rooney. I see her hand is raised. Uh, Steve, can you bring in uh, Councillor Rooney? Councillor Rooney should be able to speak now. Great, thank you very much. Pam Rooney, uh, 42 Cottage Street. Um, thank you for letting me listen in on your conversation. I had a question that came to mind and that has to do directly with you all. And that is um, if a proposed duplex or triplex um, is, is proposed for a non-conforming lot, given all the other considerations, does that not kick that immediately back to the ZBA? Do, is there any point in saying it's by building commissioner only when in fact um, it would otherwise be a, uh, a non-conforming lot it would, and it would come to you automatically? So I'm just confused about the jurisdiction would, would lie. That's, you know, I, that's a good point. Councillor Rooney, um, that's is that nine point one that we were talking about earlier, um, Rob, and is the is the councillor right? So cur currently, for one and two family, 
if there's a non-conforming lot that exists and the proposal is to build something that otherwise meets all the other zoning requirements, it would not come to the zoning board for that uh, that application, you know, that proposal. It would be it would be built to meet setbacks and coverages and be a use that's authorized uh, by a yes, let's say. Um, that would not come to the zoning board, say a single family house, single family house on a non-conforming lot. What this proposal is doing is um, adding in triplex to the one and two family uh, ability to do that. So I, in, in those three instances now, um, meeting all the other requirements, the proposal would follow whatever path is in the table. So it'd be site plan review. So there'd be no need to come to the zoning board. I'm I'm sorry. Say that again at the very end. So if you have a triplex on a on a non on a uh, non conforming lot, you have a proposal to build a triplex that would normally if it didn't if it met all the other um, zoning requirements, setback, everything else, it would it would. Um, have a yes or would it have a building or would it have a site plan review i i believe in the table that was up earlier is the site plan review okay. and it would follow it would follow whatever whatever the path is in table three it would follow that path and i think i think it was site plan review for uh triblex and and the same same duplex would be site plan review as well or would the Similarly, I think there's I think there's both there's yes. both cases, right? So there's some that are yeah. site plan review and there's some that are yes, and then there's single family that are all yes. Council, I take up your, your maybe you had another question, but I had one more question for Rob if I could. Can you for the benefit of all of us on the call, would you describe what is a non-conforming lot? I mean, what, how how does a lot become non-conforming other than uh, minimal two square footage? Yeah, so it's typically either square footage of so the total area of the lot or the frontage uh, of the lot being deficient from today's standard. It might have met mm -hmm. the layout 50 years ago when it was different. Yeah. And the one that uh, comes up now uh, once in a while is uh, that it doesn't contain the building circle, right. uh, which is more like a lot width requirement uh, that the building circle doesn't fit where the the construction of the building is being proposed. Got it. Wait, what's a okay. building circle? I never heard of that. Building circle? Mr. Mora, yep. Yep. So every every lot has to contain a building circle that's equal to the frontage for that zoning district. So it's to prevent a lot from starting off at the proper width and then squeezing tight too quickly. And the building circle has to be placed on the lot, be able to fit on the lot where the building's being proposed. Once you get past where the building's being proposed, a lot can go into any different shape that it wants, but it has to contain the circle where the building's being proposed at a minimum. Yep. And we dealt with that in numerous special permits where we had to assess the building circle. Mm -hmm. Council Rooney, I'm sorry I took over your, your oh, um, time there. And I, and if you have other questions or comments, please go ahead. No, that was that was the question, and I appreciate the consideration of it. Thank you. You bet. Um, other comment, public comment is um, Miss Hilda Greenbaum. Can you bring Steve? Can you bring? Yes, uh, Hilda Greenbaum, two ninety eight Montague Road, and I'm attending this meeting as a, writing an article for the newspaper, but. I'm speaking for myself. Um, I will just comment. I think Ms. Fox asked the house that was in contention that was withdrawn without prejudice was on the corner of Strong Street and East Pleasant Street. I listened to every one of those hearings and wrote it up. So that's where it was, 295 East Pleasant Street. Um, the other thing that, that I, I have a comment that one of the things this is very contentious article as you can probably guess for lots of reasons and so i was thinking that some of the issues that they're trying to solve might be solved by allowing more uses in the rf area so that we don't have to call 
an apartment style or a, a building that, that really is a dormitory, an apartment style dormitory because apartments aren't allowed there. Maybe because it was a bust as a fraternity park and it's been there many, many years and the few fraternities are, are being converted to apartments, why not allow more housing in that area there and take, get rid of some of those knolls and make them yeses rather than putting them in historic districts like the Emily Dickinson district or the Lincoln Avenue district, which are really assets to the town and bring tourism. That's just one thing that nobody's mentioned and it's been on my mind that the RF area has not been useful and it should be rezoned or, or keep keep the name, but allow more uses there. And then they, I have a question for Mr. Moore very quickly. Are triplexes considered like three bedroom, I mean, three unit apartments in terms of the building code? Do they have to pass the fire suppression systems and various more enhanced building codes than the duplex? Mr. Moore, you can do that if you can. Uh, the answer is yes, they do. That's what I thought, and that's why they have them built. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. All right. Um, if there's no further comments from uh, the public and no further comments from members of the board, um, I'd like to move on to oh, Ms. Parks. Go ahead. Just, just very quickly, um, I did look up the sanitation code and it is uh, 150 square feet, feet plus 100 square feet foot per person. So 550 square feet minimum for four people. 550. And that includes that's total living space, right? Yeah. Kitchen, bathroom, bedrooms, everything for four people. I don't know if it specified that. Wh it, which um, which is impossible. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, oh well, that's, that's that? twenty. That's a twenty by twenty foot space or more. Yeah. Um, yeah just twenty five by twenty. It says each dwelling unit shall contain at least 150 square feet of floor space for its first occupant. I'm sorry, for its first occupant and at least 100 additional. So I'm wrong. It's um, 450 for yeah. four people. Um, yeah. Yep, yeah, 450 for four people. So that's 20 by 18 or so. Yeah. OK, but, thank you. But again, bear in mind Mr. that Gilbert. that's that's a that's a bare minimum prior to you know looking at building code and minimum requirements for rooms etc lighting requirements all of that so you're you're always going to be up from that that's that's sort of um that's a good benchmark for you know sort of thinking about circulation and and the like when you start putting multiple people in a room yeah i'm just trying to get an idea of like when we're talking about converted garages and things like that if someone's got a 20 by 20 foot garage can could it be you know become an, an apartment. Gotcha. Good. All right. Can you guys hear me? My earphones just died. So somebody say something. We, we can hear you. You've just got some uh, like a little distance to your. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to turn up the volume a little bit. You know, I, I I put new earphones on my Christmas list, but nobody in my family bought them for me because they didn't. They don't suffer this every week. That every two weeks, that the same thing that you guys do. So um, I'll have to do that myself. All right. Um, I think we've completed our discussion on this matter. It's going to be. We'll have the proponents of this before us next at our next meeting, which will be next week, if I'm right, Chris. I mean, Ms. Ms. Brestrup will have that at that time. Yep. Um, and, yes, Ms. Marshall. Why Why are we meeting next week? I missed, that's the third Thursday. Why? May well, I we, talk about that? Yep. Yeah, I didn't have that on my account. So generally speaking, the ZBA meets on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month. Um, since I, I mentioned that we're having a little bit of a rocky road starting out, and um, Steve and I are doing our best, but we missed... Um, we missed a public notice um, for, we, we were supposed to have a public hearing on the 16th and we missed the public notice, but 
since we thought we were going to have a, a meeting on the 16th, we asked um, Mandy Johanneke to come and explain her proposal on the 16th. So we were going to have those two things. Well, the, the first thing went away because we didn't do the public notice, but we still have Mandy Jo invited. So we thought we could meet on the 16th and then not have you meet on the 23rd, if that would be uh, agreeable to you all. Why was it thought there would be a notice? Well, you Anything probably don't want to get into the discussion <laughs> oh, okay. here okay. in the office. All right, so um, I see. So the invitation is out to the counselors to come at that date. Uh, the two counselors, at least Mandy Jo will come oh. and we hope that Pat will come as well. Okay. And there is some, there's a, a, a need to respond to this fairly quickly. Uh, they have been asked to respond back to the board this spring. So I don't want us to be behind the, behind the scene on this. So when, it, when the opportunity came up, I thought, let's take the time to do that. It's, it's not uh, Ms. Brestrup's fault, it's more mine. I, I asked Ms. Brestrup to keep this going. So that's the reason. Okay, uh, the next item on our, we could take a, a break, but I don't think we need to uh, because I think that the next ma matter won't take a long time. I, uh, we have some changes to the zoning laws, the zoning bylaw dealing with food and commercial establishments. And I would hope, I think that Rob or Chris is going to explain what those are and the effect that it had on the ZBA jurisdiction and our, our work. If uh, Steve can bring up that PowerPoint presentation that was in the packet um, on food and drink, I think that would be helpful. And we can just go through that quickly. Cool. And yeah. um, there were other documents. There was a, a um, memo to the town council from the CRC. And I think there was also a memo to town council from the planning board on this uh, proposal. And this proposal was... Um, it followed in the wake of Article 14, which you may or may not uh, remember, but Article 14 was temporary zoning that was established during the pandemic um, to allow certain things to go on and not to have to have people go through um, the um, public hearing process for certain types of uses, mainly um, restaurant uses, but also some other uses. And um, there was so much what can I say? Um, good that came out of the changes with regard to food and drink establishments that the CRC and the town council and the bid and the chamber wanted us to look into how could we make some of those things permanent and how could we make it easier to deal with food and drink establishments going forward. So this effort came out of that. I'm not saying that it's exactly the same as what was in Article 14, but the thought process started us to go down this road. And this is a proposal that was worked on by um, planning, the planning department, the planning board, and the CRC throughout um, the fall. And eventually it came to um, the town council and it was passed, adopted in December. I think it was adopted on December 29th, if I'm, or excuse me, December 19th, if I'm not mistaken. So why don't we just go through this, um, this PowerPoint quickly, and I think it'll explain things. And if you have any questions, you can ask them. So uh, as I said, this was, um, you know, something that grew out of the planning department and inspection services. Um, we had long long top talks about you know what to do about food and drink establishments in the zoning bylaw because things didn't exactly match the classic classifications in the bylaw didn't really match the uses as they were lived in the world um, and the staff wanted to update the standards and conditions which um, the staff had been working with the zoning board of appeals for years and had developed a really good set of standards and conditions that the zba used in dealing with food and drink establishments and we wanted to make them um, sort of codify those uh, standards and conditions um, in addition the food and uh, i already said this the community resources town staff and the uh, business community wanted to make certain aspects of Article 14 permanent. Um, so um, next slide, please. 
So some of the goals were <clears throat> to have the new classifications in the zoning bylaw that correspond to the actual uses of food and drink establishments, to clarify and improve the permitting process for these businesses in the downtown and village centers, to apply some of the lessons learned from Article 14. And the best thing that came out of Article 14 was the ability to use the sidewalks and the outside for dining. And I think that was a really popular thing. So some of those things are incorporated to this proposal. Um, to encourage existing businesses to stay in Amherst and expand in Amherst and attract new business to come to Amherst and to formalize and strengthen um, the administrative approval process. So the building commissioner was able to approve certain things under article 14 and we've clarified those things in um, article 11 of, these, of this proposal. And um, we did have the support of the bid and the Chamber of Commerce and we wanted to support them. So the next slide, please. So these are some of the um, projects that were permitted under Article 14, the temporary zoning. Uh, one of them was the Drake, which um, ordinarily would have gone through a special permit process, but it was able to come to pass um, using just the administrative approval of the building commissioner, and it's been very successful. And as far as I know, it hasn't caused any trouble for anybody. Um, another one is the spoke, the expansion of the spoke. The spoke took over this whole building that is um, next to One East Pleasant Street, or no, next to Kendrick Place. And as far as I know, uh, well, I think that issues related to the spoke expansion have been um, dealt with and corrected. So this is one of the one of the projects that we think of as a success. Uh, the Mexicalito Taco Bar, uh, which is the former Reyes, was also opened under Article 14, as was Garcia's. Garcia's took over the old Bertucci's building, and that's really been successful too. So those are examples of things that have been able to come to pass with only the building commissioner um, reviewing them. Next slide, please. So um, we wanted to show you where in town um, these food and drink establishments can occur. So this is a map of Amherst and the white space is showing all of the places where food and drink establishments cannot occur. And the red and striped um, and dotted places are the places where these can occur. And one of them is in North Amherst um, up by uh, Coles, what used to be Coles Lumber and is now Coles Building Supply and the North Amherst Village Center. Of course, in the center of town, food and drink establishments can also occur. Um, and to the west, over on University Drive, that's that little area that's kind of striped to the to the left in this map. And the few places along um, College Street and Main Street are uh, village center and commercial districts where these uses can occur. There's a little one out on Belchertown Road, um, and that's at the intersection of Gatehouse Road. There used to be a little business there, but right now there isn't any business there. Um, the one in the middle is where the farmer's supply is, that little um, elongated rectangle. And then if you go south, there's a kind of odd shaped one at the intersection of Pomeroy Lane and 116. That's the Pomeroy uh, Village Center where, um, what's there, Mo Moan and Dove and Mission Cantina is there. And then if you move on to the south, we have um, Atkins Corner, and there's, I guess there's a small food and drink establishment that's associated with Atkins Market. So that's where these things can occur, just to give you a sense that they're not like all over town, they're just localized. Next slide, please. So um, this slide compares what existed in the bylaw prior to the uh, new zoning. Um, we had uh, three uh, types of food and drink establishments. We had class one restaurants, um, which were restaurants, cafes, lunchrooms, and cafeterias. They closed before 1130. They could serve alcohol, but they had to close before 1130. Um, and they were mostly uh, allowed by site plan review. And some of them were allowed by administrative approval. If a previous um, use had been in, in a particular place and the people weren't making any changes to the exterior of the building, that kind of a new use could be allowed by administrative approval. And then there was class two restaurant or bar, which could be open after 1130, and that could also serve alcohol, and that required a special permit. And then there was a class three um, 
drive up restaurant, which required a special permit. Well, we don't really have a, a standalone drive up restaurant. We do have um, Dunkin' Donuts, which has a drive up component, but that's a an accessory use. And there may be others as well that have drive up components, but there's no standalone drive up restaurant in Amherst. So we are going to eliminate that um, particular use. So the proposed uses which have been adopted are um, essentially taking uh, class one and class two restaurants and kind of combining them into one use, which is called restaurant, cafe, bar with food, or other similar food and beverage establishment. And that is allowed in the new um, bylaw by site plan review, or if uh, such a place had, has been existing already and they're not making any changes to the exterior, it could be allowed by administrative approval. Um, the second category is a bar with no food, and that would only be allowed by special permit. And that would be the spoke. The spoke doesn't serve food. Um, and so that would be a bar with no food. Another example of that would be the Moan and Dove in South Amherst, um, which you may be familiar with. I think that's a pretty popular spot down there. Um, of course, you know, some food is required. I think you have to serve some packaged things like peanuts or or popcorn or something, but that's something that the Board of License Commissioners requires rather than the building, uh, rather than the zoning code. Um, but it's they don't have a kitchen, so they can't serve you a meal or a sandwich or anything. Then there's a nightclub, which is um, low lights, loud music, and crowded atmosphere. I think those are three things. Rob's not here anymore, I don't think, and he could definitely describe um, the uh, nightclub better than I can. But um, essentially, we have, I believe we have one nightclub here now. It's called Hazel's Blue Lagoon, and it's in back of um, buildings along Main Street. It's kind of tucked away. Um, some of you may be familiar with it, and uh, so that's that's a nightclub, and that would be allowed by special permit. And then we have another fourth category, which is establishments with more than 200 patrons. Um, and actually, I think it's changed to be <coughs> more than 200. Well, I don't remember the exact wording, whether it's 200 occupants or 200 pa patrons, but in any event, it's, it's a large establishment. And an example of that would be... Um, the hangar or ABC, which is down on University Drive, and that would be allowed by special permit. So these special permits would all be Zoning Board of Appeals special permits. They are now Zoning Board of Appeals special permits. Next slide, please. Um, oh, so we have examples here. So I, I didn't need to uh, tell you that ahead of time. So the restaurant, cafe, bar would be an example would be Johnny's Tavern, which has a um, an occupant load of 174. El Camelito, which is in the Pomeroy Lane Village Center, and that has an occupant load of 80. A Pita Pockets, which is near um, the Unitarian Universalist uh, Society, and that has an occupant of an occupancy of 21. And then the House of Teriyaki up in North Amherst, which has an occupancy of 56. So those are the kinds of uh, places that would be um, allowed by site plan review. A bar with no food, as I mentioned, would be the Moan and Dove by special permit, nightclub Hazel's Blue Lagoon by special permit, and establishment with more than 200 patrons, the Hangar by special permit. Um, next slide, please. So we also had some changes to the zoning bylaw with regard to um, Article 3, which maybe um, Steve could bring up, there's a page, I think it was page 37 of the zoning bylaw, but I can kind of talk about it. It lists these four uses that we have already talked about, restaurant, cafe, and bar with no food, and nightclub, and any of the other establishments of 200 patrons or more. And then um, it has, uh, it, it includes 11 um, standards and conditions, and I will read through them. Um, so these establishments, it says as applicable, here it is, as applicable, thanks Steve, all food and drink establishments are subject to the following standards and conditions. And again, these were taken from um, the history and experience of the Zoning Board of Appeals in dealing with some of these um, establishments. 
Uh, they would be subject to review and approval by the Board of License Commissioners <laughs> if necessary, you know, if they serve alcohol. They would be subject to other local or state codes and regulations. Accessory uses of seasonal outdoor dining, live or pre recorded entertainment involving music, and drive through facilities would be permitted in accordance with Article 5 accessory uses. Uh, the establishment would operate and be maintained in accordance with um, an approved site plan, a floor plan, a layout plan with an occupant capacity um, for indoor and outdoor. Patron management, interior and exterior, i.e. queuing, um, and that's important for some places that are open late at night. Um, management plan, a parking management plan, and a traffic impact statement. So all of those plans would need to be um, submitted and approved for any of these um, types of establishments. Um, the management plan would have to include hours of operation, specific management strategies for alcohol service, such as hours of service and patrons leaving the establishment. And that's important too, especially for late night operations. Trash and refuse storage, outdoor dining if there is any, queuing, signage, lighting, deliveries, noise containment, and response, and a response plan for complaints, and strategies to screen and buffer adjacent properties from noise and other impacts and employee parking and other requested information. So that is a pretty uh, substantial management plan. Um, they would also need electri electronic ID verification if they sold alcohol. Yeah. Um, they would need on-site staff training and current certification for crowd control and tips, which has to do with uh, service of alcohol. Um, reusable ta tableware would be used for outdoor table service, so we wouldn't end up with a lot of um, trash all around these places and the areas would be cleaned daily. Um, outdoor furniture shall be placed to meet clearance services and egress requirements. In other words, you couldn't put outdoor furniture in front of a door so that people couldn't get out of the establishment if they needed to leave quickly. And um, in the BN zoning district, and there was a lot of discussion about this, and in case you're not familiar, the BN zoning district is just a few properties. I think it's four properties, and they're in the vicinity of um, Elements Hot Tub Spa, which is on Main Street. And so um, they're really uh, mostly on the north side of Main Street, and it includes the area that the Amherst Media um, purchased and has gotten a, a building approved for that site and a few more uh, properties in that area. But anyway, the sensitivity was that it's kind of embedded in a residential district. So even though it's a business district, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't going to cause problems for people. So we did um, limit to the number of seats in, the, in that district to no more than 50 seats, both indoor and outdoor, and that the service of alcohol would cease at 9 p.m. And just for your information, the Lumberyard, which was a popular restaurant in that location, was not in the BN district. That was in, I think that was in BVC, Business Village Center. So anyway, this would be kind of on the other side of the street. And then no service of alcohol after 1 a.m. So those would be typical um, standards and conditions for any of these um, establishments. Um, what else do we want to talk about oh yes accessory uses are you interested in maybe you are interested in going through what we're what we've changed for accessory uses we have um accessory uses include seasonal outdoor dining and i wonder if steve could bring up that article five sheet there it is yep um so uh, we've allowed um, seasonal outdoor dining, dining as an accessory to any principal use authorized under Section 3.3. So we're not any longer limiting it to restaurants, cafes, bakeries, etc., but we're allowing it um, in relation to anything that is allowed in those zoning districts. Um, and it would have the same review process as the required principal use. Um, in section 5.0410, um, any structure that is part of the seasonal outdoor dining could remain as uh, could remain outdoors. We had had a, a provision that you couldn't leave these things outdoors in the winter between November and April. Well, it turned out that people did actually want to use the outdoors for dining 
in those colder months, but we're saying that you can only use these um, pieces of furniture outdoors and leave them there if the accessory use is actually active and operational. So if someone is actually um, using these places to serve their patrons, they can leave the um, tables and chairs out there. Um, section 5.0413 um, has to do with um, HVAC systems. So prior to this, we didn't allow any heating and cooling devices as part of seasonal outdoor dining. But once we went through the pandemic or entered into the pandemic, we realized that if people are going to be outside dining, you know, in the wintertime, they may want to have a heater. And we did, the town actually purchased heaters with some money that we got from the state for some of these restaurants that allowed them to serve well into the fall and early in the spring. So we didn't think that this was a, um, this requirement that they not uh, allow heating and cooling devices was reasonable since we saw the benefit of having these things. So we've stricken that. And um, let's see, then uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions on that section, but why don't we just run through the whole thing and then maybe people have questions. Um, for live and pre-recorded entertainment, um, we say that that could be allowed for any principal use that's allowed in section 3.3 or a bed and breakfast allowed in section 5.0102 with either a special permit or site plan review, whichever is allowed for or required for the um, principal use. And in the BN district, there would no, not be um, entertainment allowed outside of the building. Um, I forgot to mention up above in section 5.041, um, in the BN district, any outdoor dining would not be allowed closer than 100 feet to any residential dwelling in a residential district. Um, what else? There's just one more thing in drive through facilities. I think it's the next page, 5.043. Um, we've stricken reference to drive in restaurants since we have eliminated drive, drive in restaurants. So um, there are accessory drive through facilities, as I said, but no more drive in restaurants. Um, we've made some changes to Article 11. If Steve would bring that up. And in Article 11, it was more of a chance to clarify what some of the things that were already going on. So um, <clears throat> in, the, in the bylaw that existed before December 19th, the building commissioner was already allowed to um, waive site plan review if there were no physical changes to the exterior of a building or a site. So this clarifies that. Um, he was allowed to waive site plan review if the only change to the exterior of a building or site was the installation of signs in compliance with Article 8, or if a change of use is proposed and no physical changes to the exterior or the site will occur. And then the building commissioner determines that the change will not conflict with the purpose of the bylaw. So it's really clarifying language that was already in the bylaw. And then um, the next section for minor alterations to building exterior, the building commissioner may authorize work to proceed with outside plan review. And then he has to follow these um, criteria. And then in section 11.212, um, there's an administrative approval in instances where site plan review is not required. No work shall commence until the building commissioner has authorized work or use to proceed. The building commissioner may approve approved with conditions or deny the approval and decisions shall be made in writing. They have to be filed with the town clerk and kept on record with our department and the building commissioner uh, can consult with the planning director and be authorized to apply any of the design review standards found in Article 3, Section 3.204, which is design review principles and standards. And this is this section is really just um, making it clear what are the requirements for administrative approval. In other words, there has to be a written decision and it has to be filed with the town clerk. Um, and he can deny the approval. 
and he can improve it with conditions. So it, it, it's really just, it's not giving him more power. It's just clarifying what he has to do with the power that he already has. Um, I think that's it for section 11. And then article 12 is really just um, deleting drive up restaurants and renumbering things. And in the definition of bar, which is the first one that's in red there, uh, a bar is defined as a food and drink establishment or part of such establishment devoted primarily to the service and consumption of alcoholic beverages on the premises and in which the service of food, instead of saying is only incidental, we're saying may be incidental, just to clarify that. And at the bottom of the page, you can see we've deleted drive up restaurants. So um, do people have questions about this? This is the new bylaw that's been adopted by town council and um, it will be making life a little easier for you all because you won't have so many class two restaurants coming before you. Um, but do you have any questions or comments? Um, I just had one. Chris, when is the most recent publication of the town bylaws? June of 2022. So this is not in the town um, yeah. the bylaw yet. And Steve is working on that. In fact, he's sent um, the version to me and Nate to be approved. And we have not done that yet. So it's sitting with me to approve that. But this will be published shortly. And um, we're hoping to get it up online soon. Good. And, and when you do, you'll, you'll send us a copy. Yes. <laughs> Which because yeah. I'm looking at a January 4th, 2022 um, copy of the, of the zoning bylaws. And so when they're ready, I know we'll get a copy. That'll be good. Yes, definitely. And I'm sorry that you don't have the June of 2022. Well, you know, I'm, I, I may have one, but I know yeah. I don't have one more recent than that. So I'll, I'll look for the June of 2022. If I don't have it, I'll, I'll get back. You don't it. have it. I'm just realizing yeah. that the latest paper copies were January 4th of 2022. Yeah. And the, the June copy never came out in paper because we were working on zoning bylaws to change Thank it. You. So now we've got those all wrapped up and we can publish this. Yep. <laughs> Great. And two other two other questions. Number one, can you create a zoning map? I've talked to Steve Stephen McCarthy about this. Can you create a zoning map that distinguishes that you can that you can give to us on paper that distinguishes the various different residential zoning districts either by color, by cross hatching, or whatever? Because when I look at the map now, most of the residential zoning districts all are in white with they have a boundary around them but it's hard to discern rg from l you know r rn so that would be really helpful for us in especially in looking at this most recent zoning proposal that would be really good um i think that was the only thing i had okay but, we'll have but, to work with it it on that yes yeah, we don't have that right now Yep, I know you, you don't have it now, but if you can work with somebody to come up with one, mm -hmm. I think it would really help our work because a lot of our work is in that residential mm -hmm. districts. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Um, Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I'm just curious as to whether Article 14 was withdrawn at the same time that basically everything in it was moved into the, moved forward in the zone code. Article 14 sunsetted on the um, 31st of December 2023. That's how it was written. It, in, in fact, it was written to sunset at the end of 2021, I think, and then it was extended. It was extended twice. In any event, the last extension went to December 31st of 2022. So it's sunset. It's over. Okay. Sun's over, yeah. Great. And one last question. Are you done, Ms. Marshall? I'm sorry. Is that one last question? Is the the Drake a nightclub, like like um, Hazel's? I think the Drake is a bar with no food. Okay, bar with no food. I'm just trying to. I I know it's subtle the differences between the two, and I I haven't been in Hazel's, but I've been in the Drake, and it feels like a, a nightclub, but it's a bar with no food. All right. And I don't Great. think it's. Um, I don't think it has low lighting and crowded conditions and I don't know. I haven't been there. Yeah. <laughs> oh. 
Th that's all that, that was helpful. Thank you very much. All right. Any other questions for Ms. Brestrup? Okay, well, I think it's instructive that we have, um, oh, Ms. McCarthy, did you have something? Yeah, just to up. comment on that, I'm trying to find the um, the exact building code definition nightclub, and I wasn't able to pull it up, but that's how this new zoning bylaw section defines it is in relation to um, an addendum to the building code. And um, Chris pretty much hit the nail on the head. Uh, there is a more precise wording to it, but it involves low light conditions, music being played, especially live music or am any amplified music, um, you know, yeah, dim conditions. And um, <laughs> So while the Drake was not permitted as a nightclub because that didn't exist at that point, per the building code, it was uh, considered a nightclub, and that just includes some additional safety measures they have to put in. I believe the spoke was also so classified after um, the last round of renovations. Um, so there are a couple in there, although if per zoning, they would be um, pre-existing in a different category. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, this is good to know that these changes are happening in town and, and how it affects our or what the work we do. And good to know what we still what we're still um, involved in in the special permits for some of the uh, food and commercial establishments. So thank you very much. Um, lastly, the next order of business for the tonight is a public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. So this is the time when the public can talk to us and express their opinions on anything except that which was before the board tonight. And um, I would see if there's any attendees that wish to speak. And there seems to be no hands raised from the public. Okay. All right. I think we've, we've uh, completed our business for the night. We meet next Next Thursday and on the agenda is the presentation on the zoning changes. And um, that's what else, Chris? That's it, right? I believe that is it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. We have that those two things before us next week. And if the new other new members, um, new associate members are here, um, we'll make sure to introduce them. Should I put that on the agenda? No, let's, let's wait and see if no, we'll just I'll just do that if they're on. Um, I don't want to disappoint anybody if they're not, if they don't show up, you know. It, <laughs> those people that read our agendas, I don't want to disappoint them. So anyway, um, unless there's any other uh, business before the body, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Ms. Parks moved. Mr. Maxfield, is I, did I see you seconding it? That's second. And I heard you too. All right, this is non-debatable, and but does require a roll call vote. Um, chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Ms. Ma Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Uh, that's four out of five. It passes. Thank you. We'll see you all in a week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.